that afternoon and thanks for joining us. We will give folks a few minutes to arrive and then we'll get started shortly. Okay, let's go ahead and get started. Uh, thank you everyone for joining today and welcome to our training, Special Considerations in Custody Cases Involving Immigrant Children. My name is Sarah Wittry. I'm the Pro Bono Program Manager here at MBLS. And just a bit of housekeeping, the slide presentation you're going to see today is available for you to download in the handout section of GoToWebinar. And we're also happy to take any questions as we go along. Uh, to ask us a question, please post your questions in the chat and then I will read them out loud to the group. Uh, so yeah, we appreciate you joining us today to learn more about the issues that can arise in custody cases involving immigrant children. Uh, we know there are pro bono attorneys uh, and volunteers from both MVLS and KIND joining us today. And we really appreciate all your hard work helping our clients at both of those organizations. Uh, we're lucky to have joining us today Alejandra Marisi uh, to train us on these issues. Ms. Marisi is a senior attorney with the KIND Baltimore office. Since 2014, she has been providing direct legal representation services to unaccompanied children and their families in the Maryland area. Prior to her position with KIND, she was a solo practitioner and a staff attorney with Catholic Charities of Baltimore. Thank you again, Ms. Marisa Marisi, for joining us. Thank you for having me. Um, yes, so I'm very happy to be here because I do think that we can cover an area that's not often covered. Um, and we have had several conversations about immigrant children and when they go through both of our organizations. And um, one of the biggest fears for me is missing a child who would have some form of immigration relief and us just not knowing it and thinking about it once let's say the child is 21, that something could have been done in a process that happened before. And um, it seems like MVLS shares that concern with me as well. I've had conversations Absolutely. with her. Yes, yeah. and with Susan, Francis as well. Um, so I'm very happy to be here today to have this, um, this webinar today. So let's go ahead. Um, that first slide has my information. I just wanna say up front, if you have any questions, please feel free to email me directly. Um, I, because I had that concern, I will happily answer any questions that you have if it means that um, we are protecting or helping to protect the child or make sure that they have access to a relief that's available to them. Um, so I work for KIND, which is Kids in Need of Defense. KIND is a nonprofit. We have, 10 offices nationally, and we have two teams that work without an office. We um, started out in 2008. It was founded by Angelina Jolie and Microsoft. And since then we have greatly grown in large part due to the demand. Um, but we have a similar model as MVLS in that we work with pro bono attorneys. We have in our Baltimore office, we have attorneys that also provide re direct representation and mentoring to the clients, but there's no way that we could meet the need that is out there without the support of pro bono attorneys. So um, I'm just always so grateful to the pro bono work because it just exponentially um, helps us create a greater impact in our community. And I have some like basic Statistics in this slide here, which just says that 60% um, of children arriving in the US have no one to represent them in immigration court. So at KIND, we work with unaccompanied children. That means that they are children who came to the United States alone or found themselves in the United States alone. Most of the time when we, have, um, we come across the children's referrals, they're already in removal proceedings, which means that there are cases were started in immigration court. And if nothing's done, ultimately at the end, the judge signs a removal order. Um, 
they are not entitled to any legal representation. As opposed to other areas of law, they have to come up with it on their own. So a lot of the times, these children do not have the means. And of course, if you think of a child coming here on their own, finding their way here, um, and not having family sometimes, and being underage, they don't even have the ability to have a job and you know, come up with the means to, to hire somebody to represent them. So that's where we come in. We um, represent these children while they're in removal proceedings. And you can see right there, another statistic that's always like very alarming to me is that children without representation are five times more likely to be deported back to danger. Um, we, most of the children that we see are eligible for relief. And that's why that statistic's scary because of course they cannot defend themselves and they cannot speak for themselves. Some of them do not speak yet. So it is, um, that's also another fear because a lot of them have relief and they just cannot articulate it or can, they cannot put a case together. So this is why our work is so significant. Um, but yeah, that it says also in this slide that that's where we come in, we provide lawyers. We also have a lot, we do a lot of advocacy work. Our headquarters are in Washington, DC, and we're constantly very busy trying to um, file briefs or like advocate for certain policy changes or against some policy changes. And so um, we've been very, very busy lately. Um, and we do help them also when the children do not have any form of relief and it's also determined that it's in their best interest to actually be in their country of origin, we help them reintegrate safely. So not all children stay here, but in the event that they have to go back, we try to do that in a way that, that is the safest for them. Okay. Thank you. So when we see the children, these are like the most common forms of relief for unaccompanied children. At the top of the list is something called special immigrant juvenile status, and we call it SIGE for short. And that is why I'm here today to talk to you about this, because SIGE is an interesting form of relief in immigration in that it incorporates representation in a state court. But SIGE is, um, a child is eligible for SIG if they are unmarried, under 21 years of age, they were abused, abandoned, or neglected by one or both of their parents. And so that one or um, reunification with one or both of their parents is not viable. And it is in their best interest to stay in the United States. Um, we also do see other cases. We have asylum is the runner up there, very common form of relief with children. We have the T visa, which is for um, victims of severe forms of trafficking. And then we have U visa, which is for victims of a qualifying criminal activity, but that has to have happened here in the United States. So next slide. So yeah, like I mentioned over there, I just wanted to have this front and center here is that these are the children who are um, eligible for, to apply for SIG. And everything with immigration is, um, every form of relief that involves an application, you apply for something. And so the application for um, the, it's the I-360, which is for special immigrant juvenile status. And you need to provide evidence that you meet this criteria, this federal criteria that's here. And so, you know, unmarried, under the age of 21, we have the birth certificate, and that's the way that we can, um, that's proof that we can provide with our filing. But the rest of the criteria that they're dependent on a juvenile court, that they are not able to reunify with both parents, that it is not in the best interest um, of the child to return to their country of nationality, that is something where um, federal law requires somebody with authority to make those determinations. And that person is usually a family um, family court judge. Um, so let me see, let's go to the next slide. So this next slide shows also that special immigrant juvenile status is a pathway to citizenship eventually. 
it's a pathway for them to for the children to become permanent residents which is why it, it's such an important form of relief in immigration the first step before we do anything as i mentioned is getting a judge to um to give us a, sp a predicate order with the findings that we mentioned before the next step after that is to put that together with the application and send it to um, USCIS, US Citizenship and Immigration Services. Once that's approved, um, then the next step, the final step there in this slide is for them to apply for adjustment of status or permanent residence or to apply for their green card, like people say it. Um, so it's, this is the very first step. The state court part um, is the fir very first step and it's why we wanted to talk to you today. So here's the um, the conversation that we were having with Sarah and that we've had with Susan is like, what if in at MVLS somebody's representing a child and they don't know, and this child might be eligible for SIDGE and we don't wanna miss the opportunity because right at that point while you're seeking custody is a critical point to ask for the, um, ask the judge for a predicate order. So we thought of, um, what are some questions to ask and i want to say right off the bat that you're probably asking these things already and many of you have been practicing for some time and are aware of a lot of the laws and cases that i'm going to mention but i do want to add some context and connect it to special immigrant juvenile status so i think it is very important to always ask where was the child born um a lot of the children themselves, if they're very small, they might not know that they were born in another country. So this is a conversation to have with the parents just to find out um, where exactly they were born. The, uh, the next question to ask is if there was also a custody process or a determination made in another state or country. Um, and the last two questions are if there's any other siblings who might be over eight, the age of 18, but under 21, who are also born in another state and country. And then lastly, where's the other parent? This becomes very significant when we talk about notice and service as well. Um, and in the case of guardianships, where are the parents, both of them? And what I'm gonna do next is that I'm gonna talk about special considerations addressing these questions and why we ask these questions. So the first special consideration is a uh, different country of birth. And when you think about that, there's, I'm sorry, we got a call. So um, this is a special consideration because in Maryland, according to the Maryland code, we treat another country as a state. So you might already have experience um, dealing with a child that was born in another state or maybe even a custody order from another state but it is important to remember that the foreign country is treated as a state as another state it's also important because you um, need to establish jurisdiction and if you want one of the things that we need with SIGE is to make those findings as to the abandonment abuse neglect um, and if somebody already made those findings then this court does not have initial jurisdiction. Also another important thing, um, and I added the case law there, not, sorry, the law there is that the definition of home state. So if somebody had just moved here for custody purposes, um, let's say you get a child who arrived here three months ago, there is a definition of home state. It usually requires for the child um, the and the parents to have lived here for at least six months. There is also an argument, I say this here, there is an exception. You could argue that um, this court can have emergency jurisdiction when there's another court that doesn't. Um, so for example, if the child was fleeing to come here, um, you can argue that their former country no longer has jurisdiction and that there's a need for this court to assume jurisdiction now. Next special consideration is, and I mentioned it already, is if a custody determination was already made. Um, this usually means that Maryland does not have initial jurisdiction. 
this is important for us because we're asking the judge to make all these findings. So if usually if there's a case for us that already has a custody order, um, then we need to think of alternative avenues to get the predicate order. So the Maryland will give full faith and credit to an order from another state. And so that is why it's important to look at that and to ask the parents, hey, in a even if it was a divorce, did you divorce that person? Did, was there ever a determination about the child? Was the child ever mentioned? And I wanna mention something here that's very unique to the immigrant community as well. And that's um, that sometimes they'll, they'll use the term custody loosely. And they'll say like, a judge gave me custody. And um, it is very important for you to view these documents yourself, for you to insist that they get a copy somehow and, and then to go through it. Um, a lot of the times what the parents actually have is a power of attorney or a simple document that was drafted with an attorney or a notary and not exactly a judicial order. So that is very, very big. Um, so even if they say like, hey, I had, we already decided this, if they have a power of attorney, you can move forward because that is not somebody who made the initial determination as to custody. And, um, but if they do happen to have a judicial order, then you, one of the options at that point is for you to request um, to register an out of, out of state child custody order. Um, I put the article and title there for you to see that. And I think most of us know that like we, you can Google Maryland family law forms and you will see the um, fillable forms online and you can follow that. And um, for the request to register an out of state child custody form to do that filing with the court. Um, another special consideration with all of these things is that you might have documents in another language. And this means that you will need to have them translated. And before you file anything with the court, they need to be um, have a certification of translation so that the court can address and register this order. Sometimes the court um, registers the order and it's almost like an like an administrative matter. I have filed, I have done this in the past where I will send the request to register the order with the translated order from another country. And then I just get, I just get the order back from the court with a case number, a caption here, and it's it's a registered order, just kind of giving it full faith and credit, like I said. Um, so you will have that. So for purposes of SIG, of special immigrant juvenile status, um, that still doesn't, just registering the order doesn't necessarily give us the opportunity to go before the judge to request the special findings. So one of the things that we do often is that we do a petition to modify custody. So if you take anything away from this particular slide is that you should really look at this document when there's been a de uh, previous custody determination. One, because you wanna see whether it's really a judicial order. And the other thing is you wanna see what was um, already determined. So for example, if they determined that um, there was gonna be visitation from the parent and now the child is here and the parent is in another, another country, then you can you you can request to modify the custody order to say hey all of this stuff has happened now and so we need an updated order it's a an opportunity to update it based on all the changes that have happened um, if for example if the child was abandoned or abused or neglected in any way, but that was never addressed in the initial custody order, then that is definitely something that you can bring now and petition to modify custody, get your foot in the door in a sense, and then request the findings that um, the child will need in order to apply with um, immigration. Special consideration. This one I think is my favorite. Um, 
children between ages of 18 and 21 years of age. So um, the Maryland Code defines a child as an individual under the age of 18. Um, but there is a special um, provision in the code as well that says that for the purposes of subsection B10, a child means an unmarried individual under the age of 21. And B10 states that the, an equity court has jurisdiction over the custody or guardianship of an immigrant child pursuant to a motion for the uh, factual findings that we've been talking about. Um, so this is very interesting. I don't know if you remember when we talked about um, the criteria for SIG, it was one of the first two bullet points was that the child is unmarried and that the child is under 21. And that is because USCIS defines a child as somebody who's unmarried and under 21. In a lot of states that causes um, a filter because if you, if a court only has jurisdiction over minors and individuals who are under 18, you are eligible to apply for SIG until the age of 21, but you cannot get this first predicate order um, because you are 18 or 19. This is a change that came about um, in Maryland in 2014, took effect on October 1st, 2014. And we are one of the only states that has this kind of state law that puts us in alignment with, um, with the USCIS definition of it. This turns out to be great because um, a lot of the children don't travel by themselves. A lot of people ask me, how does a small child come here alone. A lot of them come with an older sibling. A lot of them come with an older um, relative or anything like that. And so there were a lot of times when you have somebody who turned 18 and you have somebody who's under 18. And before, before this change in the law, like only the one who was under 18 will be eligible for this. Um, I think there might be a question. I'm not sure or a comment. Maybe that was Sarah, okay. Um, so the so that's why this is important to to have that in there. It allows us, it expands the jurisdiction. It allows us to bring um, a, bring forth a case for the custody or guardianship of somebody who's between the ages of eighteen and twenty one years of age. I bring that up here. I say I think that maybe somebody seeks custody and talks to MBLS and is thinking of their smaller child, but there, if there's other children or if there's other individuals, siblings in the household who are up to the age of 21, that's something to consider, that's something to ask so that they can be included in the custody determination and, and then um, get a predicate order for them for that. I think one of the reasonings behind this is also that an 18 year old who just got here, who doesn't understand the language. And this is always my argument when this has come up, um, is, in removal, is in immigration removal proceedings, um, doesn't understand the system, cannot work. So these children are not authorized to work. They don't have any, cannot receive any benefit. So they are completely dependent on an adult. And I think it does create an incapacity. And so it's not your regular 18 year old. It's not your regular 19 or even 20 year old. Um, so it is, it is just really great that we are one of the states that can do that and um, include children up to the age of 21. Um, what is also noteworthy there, just you don't have to go back, Sarah. <laughs> okay, um, is that I am very careful with my wording. I don't refer to um, a client who is over 18 as a minor in my filings or anything like that, I use the definition and that's child. So I can say immigrant child throughout my custody um, complaint or throughout any of the other pleadings and forms. Ah, next slide, um, special considerations. This is notice and service in foreign countries. So of course, if um, Custody, law, um, custody complaints, they create an adversarial process. And so that means that you will have to serve the other party. 
Um, I added here something also that says that it's required. And when the um, when the person, and this is also from the Maryland UCCJEA, um, when a person's outside of the state, it has to be, service must be, and notice must be performed in a manner prescribed by the law of the state. So um, there's the Maryland Methods of Services, which is Sheriff Personal Service and Certified Mail. Um, I have there that our preferred form of service is personal service. Um, when a person is outside of the US, um, service just becomes a trickier part of the entire process. Um, there's addresses are not the same. There's other ways that you can try to do this that have just proven in my personal experience not to be as effective as personal service. So, um, you know, I've tried to serve somebody in another country and the postal service workers were on strike. And so it never got to the person. The initial um, summons with the custody um, pleadings has to be delivered and, and they require like restricted delivery, which means somebody needs to sign for it. Um, and so that tends to be the real tricky part. Even when you pay extra sometimes for this service to happen, um, it doesn't necessarily happen. And I've had that experience with FedEx and um, where I have paid and I insisted like it's so important for them to get the signature and they were like, but we have proof that we delivered it. They're like their system and, and the driver and everything, but they never captured the signature. And so then you're in trouble and you did that for nothing and it's a waste of time. The other thing is that um, every jurisdiction has a preferred, um, I guess, delivery carrier. Some, um, some courts prefer that you do everything through DHL. And so that is also important for you to know. If you are gonna go that route, like call the court first. Um, I have had instances in which we've spent a lot of money to serve somebody in another country and then the court rejected it because it was done through FedEx and it wasn't DHL. Um, so that is very important. The way that we do personal ser service is that we ask the parents if they know of um, an attorney or a notary in home country. In a lot of Latin American countries, the only people who are notaries are attorneys. So people use those terms interchangeably. But I ask if there is somebody in home country that they know in their area who can perform this service for us. And so I will, they will get me the information. We contact that professional um, via email and I let them know, hey, we're trying to serve this person. We need you to be able to do this. He, here's what needs to be served and I can email it to them. Please print it out. We, we provide all the instructions, send it to them and then have them complete an affidavit of service, notarize it um, and then scan it and send it back while mailing us the original. And that to me seems to be like just the cleanest way to do it. You're also working with a professional over there. A lot of our clients um, are not that tech savvy um, or maybe their family members in home country are not. So this tends to um, just really, really make things a lot smoother in the process. If I find, if I see the affidavit, let's say, and I'm like, oh, wait, you, you guys forgot to fill out where you serve this person. I have somebody to reach back to and try to correct that. Um, all of that is so important because of the summons expiration. And I have that here as a last um, point. The summons expires within 60 days after it was issued. And so if you are trying to get this served in home country and there's a delay somehow and you pass those 60 days, even if you eventually serve it, it is not gonna be accepted. Um, the summons had to has to be valid when it is served and so you at that point which has always has happened also at that point what you have to do is um, 
request another summons and try to do it again. So it can get a little bit crazy. This is why another, I guess, tip or thing to keep in mind with notice and service is that if you are dealing with a foreign country, you should think about what you will be doing about service and notice before you even file the custody complaint. You're probably already doing this. You probably already, um, this is part of what you usually do with your cases here anyway, but it's it's a bigger consideration than like, what is actually gonna happen? Do we know somebody over there? Um, instead of deciding it once you already had the summons. Alejandra, if I can ask a quick question about that. Yeah. I think these points you're making are so helpful um, and this kind of uh, alternative service um, can really be tricky in these cases. Um, but methods of service, when it comes to the method of mailing back to the court, and you were saying that some courts prefer DHL and some prefer FedEx, I, I liked the point you made about um, just calling the court that you're dealing with and making sure. But also, do you happen to know any off the top of your head that, that have a strong preference for one of the other? I, I think so. I definitely, the city, Baltimore City, definitely prefers DHL. And I think DHL, for the most part, it's preferred. I think some will accept um, FedEx, but I, I do think that DHL, I don't know why they, there's a difference for them between the two of them, but. Yeah, it's it's good for us to know because I think in my experience too, just a lot of things internationally seem to occur over DHL, but perhaps if we usually practice domestically, we haven't experienced that. So that's something to look into and make sure you're more familiar with using DHL more often. Yeah. Thank you. And also, for, thank you for bringing up alternative service. So this is another thing that happens if you don't know where the parent is, which happens a lot for us in our cases, or if this case is a case of true abandonment, um, you might not be aware of where that parent is or what happened. There's times when you're like not sure if the parent is dead. I mean, there's so many considerations, but you can file a motion for alternative service. And that can be done by posting or publication that just becomes a little bit more involved um, depending on the judge and what they um, decide. So, but just as a heads up, in order to file a motion for alternative service, you need to prove that you've made good faith efforts. And our code doesn't define good faith efforts, but what I have found to be really useful with the court in trying to get alternative service is when you have objective accounts of the efforts as well. So for example, in, in Baltimore County one time, I, I filed a motion for alternative service where we had searched for this person and through Facebook and done like a military person search. We have um, tried to find them, the parent in this, um, the plaintiff had tried to look for that client, had had her mother in home country, go to city hall, like the mom had done a lot of things. And so we, we detailed that to Baltimore County and they rejected it. But then I had, I got an affidavit from mom in home country detailing her efforts and the fact that she had gone to city hall and, um, they wouldn't give her any information because she wasn't related to that person and that the numbering on the id cards in that home in that country had changed so the id card that we had for this person was old and they couldn't find them she detailed all of that and the court immediately um granted that motion for alternative service so i i think of like trying to go a little step further and showing efforts from, from other parties or just objective um, searches is, is, is useful in those, so. Okay, um, special consideration, basis for the SIG finding. So like I mentioned in the beginning, um, one of the things that we need to prove when we file for special immigrant juvenile status is, um, predicate order we need with the findings of neglect abandonment or abuse and it specifically states that it has to be under state law so um that means that in whatever jurisdiction you are they must use the state law 
to define that. So we've had a lot, we have a lot of really good positive case law in Maryland for cases that are related to SIGE. One of the first one was Simbina versus Bunai. And that was one in which the court, um, the judge found that, or believed that it was inappropriate to try to do these findings in the middle of a custody proceeding. They thought that this had to have a separate proceeding in order to just address these findings. And so Simbina stated they held that in an ordinary custody proceeding, a circuit court must enter factual findings. This was also very helpful because I, there was some hesitation from state court um, judges about finding, actually doing this, like getting the predicate order for these findings. I think the fear was that they were making some sort of immigration determination that some somehow this was gonna like they were gonna be questioned because they're not immigration attorney uh, judges and the truth is that the law requires them to make that determination based on state law so it is an appropriate place to ask that and um, yeah so we did have a lot of judges that were hesitating that would not grant these in the very beginning once we were doing these cases but now it is common practice. I think that a lot of our judges are educated on this and we try to also educate um, new judges about it as much as we can. Another, um, another really great case, it's a, it was a guardianship case, it's Inri Danny G. And um, in this set was about the standard that a court should use in determining whether a child has was abandoned, abused, or neglected, basically. So that court said, um, and in, in Danny G, when it was before the state court, and I think it was in Baltimore City, um, the judge said, well, what the facts presented was neglect here in Maryland, but they felt that culturally in another country, they wouldn't have found that to be neglect. So um, Danny G, Henri Danny G was, is very important because it set the standard and it held that the standard for neglect, abandon and abuse is what we have under Maryland law. Like for example, and this comes up a lot, is um, the example of the case where children are working. So that is, we do find that to be neglectful here. If you have a child under 14 who is working or who's, who has to do a lot of manual labor, we've had cases in which the children had to get up at 5 a.m. And, and stop going to school so that they can work. And so, um, and, and that's the point that the judge was making in refusing to find neglect in that case. It's just like, well, that for them, that's the norm. Um, I don't know how the judge knew this from another country, but um but the law again just this we decided hey no just use our definitions so you you're probably already very familiar with the definitions for neglect abandoned and abused in under maryland law we also were asking for in the predicate order for a finding of a best interest what is in the best interest of the child is it in their best interest to stay here or to go back um to that parent who abandoned, abused, and neglected them. And so the best interest um, standard that we use is also the one under Maryland law, which is guided by the Taylor versus Taylor factors and Montgomery versus Sanders. Um, and then lastly, one of the most recent cases was the case that identified the applicable burden of proof in such cases. In this case, the judge had decided that um, the client had to, the plaintiff had to um, provide clear and convincing evidence and they just felt like what they had provided was not enough. And the court held that um, usually Maryland law requires courts to apply the preponderance of evidence standard. So that is what they were gonna go ahead and um, apply the same to such petitions. Okay. 
Uh, last, this is one of my last slides, but it's the special consideration, the predicate order. So once we have a custody case in um, family court or we have a guardianship case, you are essentially at the end asking for two orders. One is going to be the custody order and one is going to be the special findings so that the child can apply for SIG. Of course, in a guardianship case, there'll be a guardianship order. And so there are two separate ones. The predicate order, we needed to have all those five findings that we've talked about before, that the kid is under 21 and unmarried, that the juvenile is dependent on a court and has placed, been placed under the custody of an agency or an individual appointed by the court. The court has jurisdiction under state law, reunification, reunification with one or both um, of the juvenile's parents is not viable and that it's in their best interest to stay here. All of that has to be there. We have um, samples and templates for these already for these proposed orders. Uh, but one of the things that's very, very important is to always check for the most updated version of this order. We have, I've been practicing and doing cases in state court with SIGE, SIGE cases for some time now and the proposed order has vastly changed and the reason why it changes is because once we send it to USCIS with the application we have seen a wave of rejection based on different things so over the years one of the things was that in the order we used to say for example um, a judge determined this under state law which is in line with immigration law and then we would cite to immigration law so then we started getting um, what's what are called requests for evidence. It's they're asking, they're kind of kicking it back to us. And they were saying, um, how do we know that the judge just relied on state law? And so then we had to like kind of clean, clean up those orders and make sure that it only has state law. Um, like any citations can only be to state law, it doesn't mention anything else about immigration. Um, because USCIS will deny this form of relief if they feel that the applicant is only filing for it in order to get immigration benefits. So they need for this to be bona fide and legitimate. And so because of that, if they're like, well, why is the judge citing to immigration law when it's supposed to be under state law? That, that was questioned a lot and actually, a long time ago, they wouldn't question judges' orders at all, and they, I believe, shouldn't. But throughout the years, immigration has just gotten very, very different. And then under this, the, the current administration, we've seen a lot of um, requests for evidence based on that. There was another, even though the children can apply for SIGE up to the age of 21, one of the requirements for SIG is that the abandonment, abuse, and neglect, the neglect had happened before they were 18. So then they were just like, based on the order, we can't tell, they will kick it back. And so now if you, if you look at the proposed order, it's just, it's addressing any reasons why, when, whenever there was a trend of them denying the forms, we went back and we, um, we edited and we modified it so that USCIS would accept it. And that, that keeps on changing. Um, so we haven't seen a lot of um, denials with it now, but if you look at it, it's just strictly cites to Maryland law, it talks about when, they, when the child suffered the abandonment and abuse, and it indicates a lot of other um, things that we have seen with immigration and when they kick it back. Okay, I wanted to add this here because I know the title of the presentation was about custody um, cases, but a lot of the times we see children who come here and are with a cousin or a friend or extended family, and you can definitely um, apply most of the stuff that we talked about to guardianship proceedings. They're a little bit different. And so you can still do a motion for the factual findings that will allow the child to apply for special immigrant juvenile status 
Um, but when it comes to service and things like that, guardianship is not an adversarial process. So you can actually file these with consent from the parents to the guardianship of a minor. So in that case, I would recommend um, getting the consents first. And I would do that the same way that I talked about um, with personal service, which is identifying a notary or an attorney in home country who can help with this, sending the consents to that attorney, having him print it out, the parents show up, the, they notarize it and, um, and send it to you. The other is that um, there is some criteria to be mindful about with guardianship. Um, and I listed there the article. It, it's really interesting with guardianship. There's the, the cross between guardianship and the estates and trust article. So, and then there's another um, quite important article from the estates and trust that talks about who may not be, and they use the word may, may not be appointed um, a guardian, and it tends to have a lot to do with um, criminal background, criminal record. So it's important to look at that and to see whether the petitioner, the person who's going to be um, seeking the guardianship, um, is, is still eligible based on that criteria there. If you have both consents to guardianship, and you file this with um, the state court, most jurisdictions will then issue a show cause order. Um, and since you have technically served the parents already, but you still need to serve interested persons. So sometimes they're, um, if there's siblings involved, you might have to serve them. And the show cause order is specific and it is, it varies. Per jurisdiction but most of the time they do tell you um hey we are going to have a guardianship hearing on this case and you know all of these people and it specifies must show cause by this date if we shouldn't move forward and all of that um so my advice there is to just follow the order as it's written and um and try to do it as quickly as possible. Do not miss any deadlines so that then you could have a hearing. Guardianship proceedings. So they, they are technically opened until the age of 21 for these children, and which means that you will have to do an annual report every year since um, the date of the grant of the guardianship. But like I said, this is a, a really great vehicle to um, pursue the SIGE findings in this case and, and do that. There's other considerations with guardianship. I'd be happy to answer any questions later on, but um, like there's a training video that the person must watch and, and certify that they watched the training um, video. The thing with that is, like I said, if you have a client who speaks Spanish or something like that, that um, to be mindful of that with the video. There are transcripts online of different languages of the guardianship video. So a lot of the stuff is online. And I, I wanna add also that um, before I mentioned the Maryland um, family law forms, and a lot of them are also in both languages. So Spanish is the most common language spoken by our clients and um, the forms are in Spanish and English, which I find to be very, very helpful. So. Next slide. Okay. This is um, one of the last things. It's case processing in Maryland. This is actually a new amendment to the rule, and it went into effect July 1st of 2020. And it basically places special immigrant juvenile status matters in a fast track, in an expedited track as far as case processing. So the court is going to move quickly. This is important. Um, this is great for us because we've had cases that have taken a long time and, um, and sometimes we have kids who are about to age out. So that's why this is incredibly helpful. At the same time, I recognize that it creates another consideration for you when it comes to service. 
and anything like that. And another reason why um, you should prepare for ser service before you even file it. So, and I think that's it. Great. Thank you so much, Alejandro. That was so helpful. I feel like you answered a lot of the questions that we have come up. You know, here at MVLS, we um, help a lot of clients with custody and guardianship cases, but we don't take immigration cases specifically, so we're not experts in that area. And so I know it has been really valuable to collaborate with you when we have questions come up. Um, and so I would just want to put in a plug for, you know, if you're a volunteer who has these issues coming up in your cases, reach out to MVLS, reach out to KIND, connect to um, our mentors in our program and um, our staff attorneys, and we can um, help work on these issues and connect the clients with additional legal advice if they need more help with immigration. Uh, I do wanna just go over a couple other quick slides here. Um, let me see. That was just some more information. Just here's a little more information about MBLS and our program where you can follow us on social media. Um, we also have a pro bono portal listing all of our cases that are available, including all our custody and guardianship cases. And this is the website you can go to for that. We also have some events and trainings coming up, um, several in December. So you can check out this website for that. Um, plus we have all of the trainings, um, including today's, we will soon have recordings of that one um, and these others available on our website. So feel free to check that out. And also, if you're not a volunteer with us yet, we would encourage you to consider signing up. And this is where you can do that. And um, I just want to give one more thank you to Alejandro for this presentation. It was really valuable to have your expertise. And do you have anything else you wanted to add? No, I think that just thank you. I, I think, um, like I said in the beginning, I always think that there are some cases that we may not be considering. So I, I thank you for being here and whoever watches this later for just trying to be mindful and. Um, the reason why this is also very important is because once you your case closes, it is very hard and very time sensitive if you want to go back and you know try to get these um, this predicate findings once you're already done. So we want to catch them at the right time. We want to be able to do something for them when when you're at that stage. So again, just reiterating, if you ask me if it means catching something and being able to help um, some children that you we hadn't even considered we hadn't we had no idea that that they were also eligible for this um i, I it's definitely worth it it's worth my time so please um email me my email is in the front of the slides absolutely that's so important uh thank you so much for making yourself available and thank you everyone for attending today we hope you have a great day Bye bye Bye. Thank you.